Hello and welcome to The Secret of the Sonnet Part 1. My name is Glenn Alexander and it's a real honour to be able to share this with you. Now, the author of the sonnet has helpfully told you what he has done on the first page. Something when I first saw the title page, I'd always wondered about, why is the I capitalised? It's always been there for us, hiding in plain sight. In this video, I will start to unravel what I consider to be one of the most beautiful games in history. In part one, I will do the outward part, explain why there are 154 sonnets, and allow love's labour to start winning the glory that history's greatest poet rightly deserves. Before I begin, if you haven't already seen my Speedy Dispatcher series, I would encourage you to go and watch that first, just so you can better understand some of the references made in this video, which will give you everything from where Shakespeare is actually buried, to his stunning stained glass windows in Westminster Abbey, to who his parents really are. It is the feathered creature that has broken away and made swift dispatch. It will be difficult to catch because it's the fastest animal in the world, the peregrine falcon. In this series, we're going to turn back and listen to the neglected child, the poor infant's discontent, the crying babe, and hopefully play the mother's part, listen and be kind. Now, I'd like to begin by showing you how I came to this realisation, which in many ways is the culmination of a year's worth of research leading up to this point. All my videos are in order on the New Shakespeare Finds playlist, uh, so you can track the development of how one discovery has accidentally led to the next. Here's the book The Elements of Armouries, all about coats of arms which has a quote from Ovid's Metamorphoses beneath this shield. Ovid's Metamorphoses, Shakespeare's favourite book, all about transformation. And if you flipped the M of Edmund Bolton, you'd get a hint as to who the true author of this book is. Now, the last page of the Elements of Armouries is this, and it says, Thus much for position the last element of the four, and here, by your good favour... I will pitch up one of my columns, the Oglatius, thanks to God, D, 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 the fourth letter of the alphabet. Now, it's worth noting that the Elements of Armouries was printed by George Eld, which is interesting because Shakespeare's sonnets was also printed by George Eld. Alarm bells should start to ring, I hope. It's also worth observing Shakespeare's coat of arms and noting that the spear, with two spears in his coat of arms, you have one that is vertical and one that is diagonal, much like or mirroring the last page of the Elements of Armouries. In The Speedy Dispatcher and a few other videos, I've shown you where the poet of Shakespeare is buried in Westminster Abbey. And if you think it's normal to have three dedicated stones to you at your place of burial, I'm going to gently suggest that this video probably isn't for you, and I'm sure there's much more entertaining and interesting content elsewhere. Now, it just so happens that the person buried underneath this stone is the only person in Westminster Abbey buried in an upright position. I will pitch up one of my columns, says the author, quite literally, his body. All other are like endeavours as to their vertical point aspire. Just like our falcon is holding his or her spear upright. Well, it just so happens there's also a falcon directly above the diamond or lozenge stone, which is also holding a scepter upright. Uh, also, if you notice behind the falcon, there's the same diamond or lozenge background. Funny that. And Hamlet does enjoy telling you, but bear me stiffly up, remember thee, and things standing thus unknown shall live behind me. I think this is pretty clear, but since we're dealing with the sonnets, here's 14 references for you. 
Now stand you on the top of happy hours, worthy perusal stand against thy sight. No matter then, although my foot did stand, feeds on the rarities of nature's truth, and nothing stands but for his scythe to mow, and yet to times in hope my verse shall stand, praising thy worth despite his cruel hand. The roses fearfully on thorns did stand, so your sweet hue, which me thinks still doth stand, but all alone stands hugely politic, when most impeached stands least in thy control, at the woods boldness by the blushing stand, to stand in thy affairs fall by thy side, my woeful self that did in freedom stand, I love this one because of the O, O, O rare Ben Johnson, O appetite from judgment stand aloof, how coldly those impediments stand forth. So, hopefully we now understand the standing bit. But I then realised perhaps it wasn't the only column he pitched up. I will pitch up one of my columns. You may also notice the I of John Wright has been italicised beneath. Now, I and J were interchangeable in Latin and earlier English, and we were just dealing with a John Sun who was standing up right. For and for. Dear Glatius, give thanks to God at Christ Church. No better place for that. DD and TT. Now, interestingly, D and T are the same physical letter, an alveolar or dental plosive. Apart from D is voiced and T is voiceless. Hopefully, you can see the overlap. Now, when we realise this is all to do with the I, our poet pretty much redefines all the sonnets for us and proves his identity. There are two games with the eyes that we're going to play. The first, in part one, is the outward fair or outward part. And then the second, in part two, is the far more complex but arguably more magnificent inward part of that, which just changes completely how we perceive the sonnets and is just truly beautiful. To set the first game up, which plays on the outward visual part, we're going to quickly look at the first ten sonnets to get the gist. Sonnet number one, or I, you'll notice has not been numbered, it's been deliberately left out to tell us something. But thou contracted to thine own bright eyes, feeds thy light's flame with self-substantial farewell. And the first thing I'll say is that all of the sonnets are a meditation on himself and what he's done and about to do. Within thine own bud buriest thy content. Then being asked where thy beauty lies, where all the treasure of thy lusty days, to say within thine own deep sunken eyes, were an all-eating shame and thriftless praise, how much more praise deserved thy beauty's use. Notice the eye there. If thou couldst answer this fair child of mine, and we will, shall sum my count and make my old excuse, proving his beauty by succession thine. So this is exactly what we're going to do. We are going to sum, we're going to count these eyes. Three, look in thy glass until thy first thou viewest. Now is the time that face should form another. But if thou lived, remembered not to be, die single. And thine image, another eye there, dies with thee. So great a sum of sums, yet canst not live for having traffic with thyself alone. Thou of thyself, thy sweet self, doth deceive, then how, when nature calls thee to be gone, what acceptable audit canst thou leave? Audit, meaning an account, a rendering, uh, which we're going to do using these eyes. Audit will also be quite important for part Two, those hours that with gentle work did frame the lovely gaze where every eye doth dwell. Uh, lo in the orient when the gracious light lifts up his burning head each under eye. Like feeble age he reeleth from the day the eyes for duteous now converted are in singleness. Notice that eye in singleness 
the parts that thou shouldst bear. Sonnet number six, we have an eye there, in thee thy summer, summer referring to our edition, ere it be self-killed, which we'll talk about a little bit later. That's for thyself to breed another thee, another eye there, be not self-wild, for thou art too much fair. Sonnet number nine, you'll notice here that there is a dot after this nine. That's because that's alerting us to a number of things. One of these being at the bottom of the page for our continuity, we have 10. And you'll notice there's also a dot there that's alerting us to the fact we have an I there that we will count. How does this one start? Well, it starts with a nice big I. Is it for fear to wet a widow's eye that thou consumes thyself in single life? When every private widow well may keep by children's eyes her husband's shape in mind. No love towards others in that bosom sits that on himself such murderous shame commits. You'll notice for sonnet number 10 we do not have a dot after it. But we will count the I in all the numbering. For thou art so possessed with murderous hate, that against thyself thou stick'st not to conspire. Another I there. Sonnet number 14. I, 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 I. But from thine eyes my knowledge I derive. I, I, from thyself, I. I think we get the idea. So here's some highlights from the rest of this sonnet, just so when we start counting, I don't have to slow down and draw your attention to bits that are really great. Uh, I engraft you knew, if I could write the beauty of your eyes, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? I summon up remembrances of things past, and what's ist but mine own, when I praise thee? Sin of self-love possesseth all mine eye, why write I still all one, ever the same? So oft have I invoked thee for my muse, all these I better in one general best, so shall I live. Oh, blame me not, if I no more can write. To me, fair friend, you never can be old, for as you were when first your I, I, I'd. Pity me then, and wish I were renewed, whilst like a willing patient I will drink potions of... I love this, Eisel, because it contains I, against my strong infection, no bitterness that I will better think. I say, mine I saith true, since my appeal says I did strive to prove, still losing when I saw myself to win. Now I find true, I am that I am, although I swear it to myself alone, and to be sure that it is not false, I swear. Then in the number let me pass untold, so though in thy store's account I one must be, your I is your one in Roman numerals, only, or well actually that says only, my plague thus far I count my gain, I might as yet have been a spreading flower, fresh to myself if I had self-applied. Uh, that's from A Lover's Complaint, the poem at the back of the sonnets. So, the rules of the game. The whole book is playable for our counting. That means it's not just a local problem of specific sonnets, but a global problem of the entire book. The title page, a dedication, sonnets, a lover's complaint, anything in there, we're going to count it all. We're only counting the capital I's only. We're not counting lowercase I's and we're not counting the L's, although they may look similar, for example, in all Lastly, I and J are interchangeable in Latin and earlier English, hence it's acceptable to count the I in dual. I will also flag now there is one cunning and deliberate fault he has made, which he does helpfully tell us about, which we will deal with when we come to it. So let's begin our counts. Here's the frontispiece and we have one, two, three. We have Three eyes on the frontispiece or title page. Here's the dedication and we have 14 eyes, which is very interesting given the sonnets are 14 lines long and we have 14 eyes there. If you add that to the three from the frontispiece, that gives us 17 eyes even before we've begun the sonnets themselves. 
I'm now going to accelerate through the sonnets, stopping only to show you one or two quite crucial things. So here we go. This is fun, isn't it? Warning, deliberate fault. Here's sonnet 107. You'll notice the eye of uncertainties now crown themselves assured. And I've circled the fault for you in green there. Now with the drops of this most balmy time, my love looks fresh and death to me subscribes since spite of him isle is that an isle you'll notice the capital i there looks awfully like the l next to it live in this poor rhyme whilst he insults or dull and speechless tribes now there is no better word to have a fault with than isle because it's an anagram of lie and it certainly doesn't look like the eye of uncertainties. Thankfully, he does tell us he's doing this in sonnets 88 and 89. When thou shalt be disposed to set me alight and place my merit in the eye of scorn, upon my side against myself I'll fight and prove thee virtuous, though thou art forsworn, with mine own weakness being best acquainted. Upon thy part I can set down a story of faults concealed, wherein I am attained, that thou in losing me shall win much glory, and I by this will be a gainer too, for bending all my loving thoughts on thee, the injuries that to myself I do, doing the vantage double, as in two, like two L's, vantage me, such is my love to thee, I so belong that for thy right myself will bear all wrong. In sonnet 89, say that thou didst forsake me for some fault, and I will comment upon that offence. I'll is a contraction of I will. Speak of my lameness, and I straight will halt against thy reasons, making no defence. Thou canst not love disgrace me half so ill to set a form upon desired change as I'll myself disgrace knowing thy will. I will acquaintance strangle and look strange, be absent from thy walks and in my tongue thy sweet beloved name no more shall dwell, notice those double L's, least I too, and we do have too much of L there, uh, should do it wrong and hap lie haply of our old acquaintance tell for thee against myself i'll vow debate for i must never love him who thou dost hate so we can see both of these sonnets are telling us against myself i'll fight i'll myself disgrace look strange against myself i'll vow debate they are telling us that he is deliberately made a fault with our isle. And actually, if we look around this fault, we have some clues that this is going on. For instance, there's our fault. The word next to it contains your isle. We start off with my love looks, double L. We have a comma there but there's no space between those words and he plays with spaces as well to indicate something's going on there's no space there which is suggesting something is afoot the word after is while and i should remind you that the sonnets are dedicated to mr w h while he insults or dull there's a double l there directly beneath these two words and if we think about the sounds within the lines we actually find this fault is boxed in with a my subscribe it i'm i'll tribes i sound it's boxing in this fault uh, so it really is the perfect place to put this fault 
But the easiest thing we can do is just make a direct comparison with our eyes. So if we take another aisle in a mid-sentence and then do a direct comparison, we can see that this is more of an L than an I. I'm pretty confident that this is indeed a very cunning and deliberate fault. I know that this author frequently employs these faults. So for that reason, this I will not be counted for it is an L. So we successfully managed to avoid this deliberate fault and pitfall. If we continue, you'll also find there's another fault uh, here. We have 115, 115, and then 119. It's supposed to be 116, but it does say if this be error and upon me proved. And then 119 again. Keep going through. And we come to 137. And since we're talking about eyes, why of eyes falsehood hast thou forged hooks? Well, it just so happens the funerary monument to Shakespeare in Holy Trinity Church, Stratford upon Avon, you happen to have underneath the monument three hooks. Why of eyes falsehood hast thou forged hooks? And if we keep going, all the way to the end of the sonnets, we find that our sum of all of the eyes in the sonnets, not including the frontispiece or dedication, is 571, which backwards would be 17.5. But we still need to do a lover's complaint. You see the eyes in William there, continue doing the same thing. Oh, Dear British Library, please could you add this page in on your website? You seem to have missed that out. Thank you very much. And also on the last page, and this is quite important, on the last page of a lover's complaint, it suddenly becomes the lover's complaint because it is the lover's complaint, as we shall see. How many eyes do we have in a lover's or the lover's complaint, we have 44, which we quite like, given Dio Gratias DD, D is the fourth letter of the alphabet, which would be 44. So the sum total of I in the sonnets, that's the frontispiece, dedication, sonnets and lover's complaint, and everything in that book is 632. That's how many I's we have, 632. Two. Now, this number may feel somewhat familiar to you because it's a numerical anagram, which is about to explain a long standing mystery. Here's the first folio for you, and here's the date of the first folio I six two three sixteen twenty three which explains why the first folio was published on that date. Now, it's all well and good saying this, but we need some further evidence to validate this. So as I showed you in the Speedy Dispatcher part two, starting from the elements of armories, it refers us to the Minerva Britanna. And in the Minerva Britanna, in its footnotes, it refers us to this book. Caesar Ripper's Iconologia, or Moral Emblems. Now, I'll hold my hands up and say I underestimated the importance of this book when I found it. Uh, for starters, there's your I, Iconologia, explained in 326 figures. Here's the last figure, 326, the will. A purblind maid, a blind maid, because seeing nothing herself. Well, let's help this purblind maid uh, see so she can make her way towards heaven. I, as an I for her, I three two six, which of course is a numerical anagram, 
of 1623. So there's it for you a second time and I will do this for you a third time shortly as well. So there we go from one will to another. Now we've looked at the capital I's, we've summed the capital I's, but there's also some direct I references. Mine eye hath played the painter and hath stilled thy beauty's form in table of my heart. My body is the frame wherein tis held and perspective is the best painter's art. For through the painter must you see his skill to find where your true image pictured lies which in my bosom shop is hanging still, that hath his windows glazed with thine eyes. Now see what good turns eyes for eyes have done. Mine eyes have drawn thy shape, and thine for me are windows to my breast, where through the sun delights to peep to gaze therein on thee. Yet eyes, this cunning, want to grace their art. They draw but what they see, know not the heart. You'll notice there's a difference of spelling between eyes for eyes. One is with a Y and one is with an I. I will speak more of that in part two. Now, since we know how to sum these eyes, we're going to do exactly the same. I'm going to accelerate through and just quickly count all of these direct I references. So here we go. So the sum of the direct EYIs in the sonnets, that's including Eid, Ein and Eisel, gives you I, 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 which is just a little too perfect to be a coincidence. And if we compare that to the Iconologia, we find I, 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 age in general. Here you have a lady holding up both the sun and the moon, who both have eyes that seem to be winking at you. And as Sonnet 43 does tell you, when most I wink, then do mine eyes best see. And indeed, you can see the moon is winking at you. We also have three AY, I references, I, me. So if we include those, that would take our I total to 114, 14 sonnets perhaps. But I, I really like that number for I 14, which I will speak of in a moment. So our grand total of 632 capital I's plus our direct EY and AY I references gives us 746. 746. If we played the same I game, I746, well, that number 1746, six is a perfect number, doesn't really mean too much to me. So if we if we get rid of these uh, AYIs, because they begin with AY, we subtract those, we get 1743. Now it just so happens in sonnet I-40, 140, it tells us to bear thine eyes straight. And funnily enough, we have three eyes that are italicised. So if we subtracted those italicised eyes, then that gives us this number here, 1740, which may be significant because that's when the Shakespeare monument was erected in Westminster Abbey, which begins the beautiful game that leads to where he is buried. Now we know that eyes are pretty important. It says in Sonnet 79, I grant sweet love thy lovely argument. And this is really beautiful because it's through love that this poet is going to reveal his identity. And since we know already how to play the eye game, Sonnet 49, when as thy love hath cast his utmost sum. So we're going to sum love in the sonnets. And do you know what? This is actually a much easier game. The sum total of love 
in this sonnet is 243. And that's just love in the sonnet, not a lover's complaint. And if you uh, if you try to cheat and use a word processor and you got 242, that's probably because you missed the love at the bottom of 141 or I for I or the bottom of the page there is I2, which may be significant to you a little bit later. So the sum total of love just in the sonnets is 243. And if we correspond this to the iconologia, you get poetry, which is stunning. So love is poetry, which I think is really beautiful. Now, at the end of this description, we have divinity as having her original from heaven. Well, that's capitalised and we just so happens in the iconologia you have figure 213 page 54 the original of love i'll speak more of this lovely emblem in part two but if you have a look in the table of contents for this emblem page 54 original love 213 and next to it is 64 rebellion well 54 is a wonderfully significant number we will take a look at shortly and four is also a wonderful significant number by the end of this video you will see that both of these numbers are very very significant so what we have bounded between these two numbers original love 2136 is again a numerical anagram of our date of publication 1623 of the first folio and you'll find your original, but with a double L, on the front. So there's your third proof of the date of publication based on this. So there we go. There's the original of love. And if we have a look at the East Triforium of Westminster Abbey, we have Cupid, the original of love, the embodiment of love. Uh, I've shown you where this is in my video, where is Shakespeare buried? And at his feet we have, life is jest and all things show it. I wrought so once, but now I know it. Now above cupids, above the masks and trumpet, we happen to have a cartouche. At the top of the cartouche we have a character with curly horns. That is Kippus from one of the last stories in Ovid's Metamorphoses. In the centre, we have a shield with three scallops, and that's shells, and five smaller lozenges. And at the bottom, we then have the same curly horns from the character at the top, the Kippus horns, which you'll find on the front of many publications as a mark of this author, such as the Iconologia. If we ask what is the relevancy of these three large shells and five smaller lozenges, well, that's because our polymath knew his numbers. Three large shells, five smaller lozenges, three to the power of five equals 243. The same number of times love appears in the sonnets. Beautiful. But why is 243 a meaningful number? Well, 24 is the number of hours in a day, and 3 that's, would be 24 three days. Why is three days poetically meaningful? Well, as our author was very religious, three days is very meaningful for the resurrection. Between death and resurrection, there were three days. This poet is effectively resurrecting himself through love. So that was the sum total of love in the sonnets. But what about a lover's complaint? For love in a lover's or the lover's complaint, as per the last page, we have six times love in the title plus 11 times love in the text which gives us a total of 17. 17 times love in the lover's complaint. 17 is a significant number to one poet in particular, the leading candidate in the Shakespeare authorship debate. This man 
Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, thought by many from Freud to Sir Roger Penrose. And if we then have a look at the corresponding emblem in the Iconologia, we get number 17, a rational soul. And if we look at the emblems around number 17, before and after, we find that number 17 is bounded by love. Love, seraphic love, love to tamed, love of one's country, bounded by love. If we then inspect the surrounding emblems a little bit closer, we find, starting on page four, instruction, which advises us to cast an eye upon our own faults so that finding blemishes in ourselves, we may endeavour to clear ourselves of them. I'll speak of figure 14 in a second because it's one of the most important in this book. Figure 15, a man in reverend posture, Funny that, because in A Lover's Complaint, we also have a reverend man who kindly lends his ear to our complaining lover. Figure 16, love tamed, Cupid. And you'll notice Cupid has a little bird on his hand, for this bird is said to be very weak and she is not able to build herself a nest, but hatches in some nest of other birds, which is perhaps why you might want to go and watch the Speedy Dispatcher series, which is all to do with another bird. Figure 17, we have our rational soul, a lovely damsel, her face covered with a transparent veil. You'll meet someone also with a veil shortly. Lovely she is because formed by the creator according to his own image. She is the image of the creator. Her veil denotes her invisible to human eyes. Her wings denote her celerity. Celerity is swiftness. If we quickly have a look at celerity, you have none other than a hawk flying in the air. The moral is obvious, all those things being naturally very quick. And yet again, I'd encourage you to go watch the Speedy Dispatcher, all about the quickest hawk in the air. Figure 18, love of our country, a vigorous young warrior standing upright, and we've already met someone standing upright, who is marching courageously over spears. Figure 19, apprehension, you can see in figure 19, and a young lady is holding a glass, a mirror, up to herself because she imprints on herself and makes all she hears and sees her own. Much like the sonnets were never before imprinted, she is also imprinting. And figure 20, a child mounted on a dolphin. Why? Because the dolphin loves yet more love. Now to the incredible figure 14 which is why I liked from our isums the 114 or I14, the love of virtue, because virtue surpasses all other loves, and that the love of it is incorruptible and never fading. Ver, via, Edward de Vere. Now, something quite interesting happens if we have a look at virtue within the sonnets. Sonnet 72, unless you would devise some virtuous lie, just note the spelling there, that's with an E, virtuous lie. That's quite amusing because 54, when summer's breath their mast buds disclosed, but for their virtue, V-I-R-T-U-E, only is their show. 79, he lends the virtue with the E again, and he stole that word, and indeed he did. 88, and prove thee virtuous, though thou art forsworn. And this is, um, coincidentally, page four of the Iconologia. 81, you still shall live such virtue, E-R, hath my pen. 117, I-17, since my appeal says I did strive to prove the constancy and virtue of your love. So you can see there's this variance in spelling here between the virtuous, V-E-R, the ver, and the I-R. If we then have a look at figure 32, a virtuous action, a man of lovely aspect, 
a virtuous, V-I-R-tuous man, never degenerates. If you just notice the title there of virtuous action, that's quite funny given the emblem has a spelling of virtuous. So he's doing exactly the same thing in this book as he was doing in the sonnets. Also just notice the book that this lovely man is holding. The book shows that learning joined with arms, coats of arms, makes a man famous and for ever renowned. Now you'll meet that book in a second but I'm not happy with just showing you something once so let me give you some more examples. Here's virtue and you can see the difference in spelling. Heroic virtue, Hercules naked, leaning upon his club, a lion skin about his arms. You'll meet this in a second. And for a fourth time, virtue, the force of virtue, which is Pegasus. You'll also notice with figure 14, love of virtue, our winged naked youth, he has four garlands of laurel, much like the laurel for a poet. One on his head and three others in his hands. But if we look at his right hand, you'll notice that those garlands seem to be forming an eight, which is awfully coincidental given the fact that Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, your loving and assured friend, E. Oxenford, who writes a wonderful prefatory letter to his loving friend Thomas Beddingfield at the front of a delightful book, often called Hamlet's Book, for its marked similarities and within this letter he coincidentally uses virtue no less than eight times and just notice the spelling of that v-e-r virtue and there's also a pilcro in this last separate paragraph which talks about virtue mounting with our minds to the highest heavens which is particularly relevant to this wonderful book the ascendance of armory which if you remember from a virtuous action learning joined with arms is precisely what this book is about learning coats of arms and how to blaze them correctly you'll also see the emblems of virtue across the shield and what seems to be either a mirror or cartoof or perhaps another shield you have the kippus horns above and below just like above the monument to cupid in Westminster Abbey. The back page of the Ascendants of Armories is this, and you're about to meet some familiar characters. Here's Hercules from Heroic Virtue and Pegasus from The Force of Virtue. You'll also notice there's an inscription with Pegasus in below, Volat alta ad sedela virtus, Virtue flies to the heavens. We have a look at what Mr Hercules is pointing to. He seems to be pointing to a P and we've met a P or Pilcrow from the letter we have just looked at and what is around the circle but your eight, eight times virtue. And what's that paragraph talking about? Virtue flies to the heavens by your loving and assured friend the Earl of Oxenford, Edward de Vere. But wait, the love of virtue still has more to tell us, because if we consider the garland in his left hand as well, that would give us 80. And it just so happens there are 69 pages in the sonnets, plus 11 pages in a lover's complaint, giving us our 80. Beautiful. So to sum up, 17 times love in a lover's complaint, which is there, 13 advises to cast an eye upon her own faults. Love, love, love. A lovely damsel. Lovely she is because formed by the creator according to his own image. Number 17. Her face covered with a transparent veil. Her veil denotes her invisible to human eyes. Love. The glass because she imprints on herself, making all she hears and sees her own. And a gentle disposition because a dolphin loves and caresses a man. So the sum total for love in the whole of the sonnet book, we have 243 times love in the sonnets, which is poetry, plus 17 times love in a lover's complaint, which gives us a grand total of 260. This corresponds to figure 260 in the Iconologia religion, 
a woman with her face veiled, just like figure 17, a rational soul, veiled because she has been always secret. And if we correspond this to the sonnets, you'll find sonnet 31, hath dear religious love stolen from mine eye, and a lover's complaint, religious love put out religion's eye. In sonnet 154, we have love hyphen God, implying our love God, Cupid, the embodiment of love. So if we count the Cupid references, and there's only two of them in sonnet 153, we then get a total of 262, which corresponds to love reconciled. It's just so beautiful and holds two little cupids with the other. It has the virtue to reconcile the two cupids that the falling out of lovers is the renewing of love, which we shall see before the end of the video magnificently done. They striving which should outdo one another so that love becomes redoubled. So to the question why 154 or I-54 sonnets. This sonnet 54. Oh, how much more doth beauty, beauty is seen by that sweet ornament which truth doth give. The rose looks fair. Well, here's his rose in Westminster Abbey, hidden behind the marble fronting, the coats of arms on. Ornament is a beautiful word because of the or in heraldic terms, coats of arms language. Or is gold. The colour gold, so you have a golden rose there. The rose looks fair, but fairer we it deem for that sweet odour which doth in it live. The canker blooms have full as deep a dye as the perfume tincture of the roses. Hang on such thorns and plays wantonly when summer's breath their mast buds discloses. But for their virtue only is their show. They live unwooed and unrespected fade die to themselves. Sweet roses do not so, of their sweet deaths are sweetest odours made. And so of you, beauteous and lovely youth, when that shall vade by verse, distills your truth. These are Edward de Vere's life dates, which make him 54 when he died. About a year ago, I made a video called Edward de Vere's life dates, which for the most part I stand by, but I did miss something. I took the O to be significant. However, if you don't take the O to be significant, i.e. it's nothing, and then do something called digit sum arithmetic, that's just adding the digits of a number together, so 1 plus 5 plus 5 and 1 plus 6 plus 4, you will get 11, 11, twice 11. The same number beginning and ending his life. And it's something of a cycle if you think about 11 on a clock. It's a full cycle. However, if you continue to do the addition of 11 plus 11, you'll get 22. And if we continue further, 2 plus 2 and also 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 gives you 4. Hence, 4 is the terminating number that fully represents Edward de Vere's life. Hence it is the mark of Vere. Vere in German is also four. Once we understand this mark of Vere, this mark of four, and the 22 of the 11 plus 11, then we can start to see this and understand it in the sonnets. For instance, sonnet 122, 122, there's a dot after it, which is telling us that something's going on. And if we have a look at the first line, you'll, you'll see you've got T, T, but there seems to be a fault there, isn't it? There's two T's for thy, and there's also two commas, um, which is another fault. Remember, the faults tell us things. Why? Because you have four T's and T comes from the Hebrew Tav meaning mark. You have the mark of four. 
right in the first line there. And it goes on to tell you this a little bit later. If thee thy record never can be missed, why nor need I tallies thy dear love to score for therefore to give them for me was I bold for I. And the last line were to import for get fullness in me. So it's telling you this in sonnet 122. Likewise for sonnet 22. My glass shall not persuade me, I am old, so long as youth and thou are of one date. They are of one date. But when in thee times fours I behold, fours I is there for you, then look, I death my days should expiate. 45, you can see the four I there. Remember our capital I is our one, so our four I. But look, my life being made of four with two alone, that pretty much spells it out for us unequivocally. It's right there for us. From a lover's complaint, a reverend man that grazed his cattle nigh. I wonder if his cattle were oxen by any chance. But at the bottom of the page, we have K2. K is the 11th letter of the alphabet. And two gives us again our 22 or our four. From sonnet I-33, or 133, myself and thee, I am forsaken, for I being pent in thee, per by force, am thine and all that is in me. And sonnet I-54, or 154, four men diseased, but I, my mistress thrall, came there for cure, and this by that I prove. So again, we have this four. And knowing this just completely changes how we even see the frontispiece. For I, it's always been there staring at us in the face. For T, T means mark, it's the mark of four. And if we have a look at the first thing that's on this page, the printing ornament at the top, if we have a look and, well, let's count the eyes. If we count the eyes, you get 11. So we start with our 11. And if we have a look at the end of a lover's complaint, we finish with our 11 too. We start, we're born with our 11, and we finish, we die with our 11 too. Now, a year ago, I accidentally wrote a book, and it really was an accident. Um, I don't think it's amazingly well written, but I did make the, all the discoveries, do all the writing whilst working full time in four weeks but it was about making progress not about perfection i wouldn't have started making videos had i not written that first but i do seem to have been surprisingly right about a number of things one of these things was the thesis that edward de beer committed suicide by taking a draft of sleeping nightshade a trope of belladonna much like juliet when in the dead Night, their fair and perfect shade, through heavy sleep on sightless eyes doth stay, and then drowning in the bath like Ophelia, so that myself bring water for my stain. Now I'm going to read through the last two sonnets. You'll notice the I-54 at the bottom of the page. Cupid laid by his brand and fell asleep. A maid of Diane's this advantage found, and his love kindling fire did quickly steep in a cold valley fountain of that ground, which borrowed from his holy fire of love a dateless, lively heat still to endure, and grew a seething bath which yet men prove against strange maladies a sovereign cure. But at my mistress I love's brand new fired. The boy for trial needs would touch my breast. I sick with all the help of bath desired, and never hide a sad, distempered guest. But found no cure. The bath for my help lies, where Cupid got new fire, my mistress I. And sonnet 154, or I 54. The little love god lying once asleep, laid by his side, his heart in flaming brand, whilst many nymphs that thou chased life to keep came tripping by, but in her maiden hand the fairest votary took up that fire, which many legions of true hearts had warmed, 
And so the general of hot desire was sleeping by a virgin hand disarmed. Miss Bran she quenched in a cool well by, which from love's fire took heat perpetual, growing a bath and healthful remedy for men diseased, but I, my mistress thrall, came there for cure, and this by that I prove. Love's fire heats water, water cools not love. If we return to our John Gray monument in the East Triforium of Westminster Abbey and our Cupid, then adjacent we have this, this oval relief, which is much akin to the emblems of the Iconolosia, which now makes sense. It seems to be almost the lover's complaint with a lover who is dying for love. She's being pierced through the heart by death and beneath her, a river and a flower, hopefully on the way to heaven, which one by one she in a river threw, upon whose weeping margent she was set, like usury, applying wet to wet from a lover's complaint. It also makes the frontispiece of the Iconologia rather tragic when you realise those are drowning men. Then can I drown an I. It also reframes what the sonnets actually are, as our poet tells us in sonnet 100, if any, be a satire to decay. But please, no longer mourn for this author. He doesn't want you to do that. This poet does not want uh, your pity. If you read 71, which of course is 17 backwards, he will tell you this. Don't mourn for him, please. Uh, why? Because I, me, I fell, and yet to question make what I should do again for such sake, would yet again betray the four betrayed, and new pervert a reconcile made. If he had the choice, he'd do exactly the same thing again. If we have a look at the corresponding figures in the Iconologia for yet more proof, we have figure 54, commerce of human life. You'll notice the me in commerce and the me, it really is a perfect word choice, of human life, e on the end of human, that's our figure of addition if you've seen any of my other videos. Um, a man with his forefinger, forefinger, pointing at two millstones standing by him, a stalk in his right arm and a buck at his feet. Millstones, as according to Luke 17.2, are used for drowning. The two stones denote action and commerce for being double. The one, lovely wordplay going on there, uh, can do nothing without the other nor grind any corn alone. The stalks help one another in flying and the bucks in swimming. Figure 154, Rome Eternal. You can see the me there, me eternal. A figure standing, a figure standing with a helmet. In her left hand, a spear with a triangular head. In her right, a globe upon which stands a bird with a long beak. A little shield at her feet and a serpent in a circle denotes eternity. The bird is the phoenix out of whose ashes springs another. Now, if we have a look at the emblems around this one, because there's some great ones. In constancy, a woman in blue setting her foot upon a great crab like the Cancer in the Zodiac. Well, Cancer in the Zodiac is this symbol, with the moon in her hand. A crab denotes irresolution, going sometimes forward, sometimes backwards, so do fickle men. The moon, changeableness, never remaining for one hour the same. The blue resembles the colour of the waves of the sea, which are extreme and constant. But you'll notice there's a flag on her head there, which doesn't seem to have been mentioned. And you think a flag on the top of her head might. Why? Because it seems to be a one. And if you notice the moon in her hand, it's very crescenty. And if I do that, you may see it's almost a zero. Why might this be relevant? Well, because this is the date of Shakespeare's sonnets. Figure 156, the great idolatry. A blind woman upon her knees, offering incense to a statue of a brazen bull. Blind because she 
does not rightly perceive whom she ought principally to adore and worship. It needs no further explanation for all those acts of adoration she blindly renders to creatures. Creatures much like this. Here's the Shakespeare monument outside his birthplace home and around the base of this monument we have from the Tempest. I wonder how many goodly creatures are here. This is an idol. Where is she ought to worship the creator only? And where is our creator? Well, it just so happens he's there. It is the statue of the brazen bull. And as it tells us in Sonnet 105, let not my love be called idolatry, nor my beloved as an idol show. So he's being facetious. She's blind. She can't see who she's supposed to be worshipping. His love is himself and he has made an idol of himself. Figure 153. Boasting, a woman making a great show covered with peacock feathers, which of course have got many eyes on, with a trumpet in her left hand and her right in the air. The feathers denote pride, the mother of boasting, the trumpet boasting of one's self. It is blown by one's own breath, for vain boasters take delight in publishing their own actions. And this particular pirate has done a lot of publishing of his own actions. And if you have a look what she is pointing to, she is, of course, pointing to our I, our one. And from a lover's complaint, oh, pardon me, in that my boast is true, the accident which brought me to her I. Now, when I found the missing lines of Sonnet 1 to 6, and you can watch that in my video, the missing lines of Sonic 126, if you want to know how. Um, I'll be the first to say I didn't realise how important they were. Here's the two lines. They were hidden in Hamlet. Ophelia was trying to give Hamlet them back when they were having a bit of an argument. Do you remember figure 262, love reconciled, two cupids, that the falling out of lovers is the renewing of love? Well, here is Act 3, Scene 1 of Hamlet, and here are the missing lines, which happen to be line 101. If we have a look at Sonnet 101, you will see this, and to be praised of ages yet to be, which just so happens to be Hamlet's first line when he enters to be or not to be. And also on the frontispiece of the sonnets, we have To Be Sold by John Wright Dwelling. To Be Sold by John Wright Dwelling. If we have a look at the lines, Ophelia's lines before these two missing lines. My honoured lord, I know right well. I owe right well you did. There's a nice little pun on left there right before the lines as well. Then do thy office muse, I teach thee how to make him seem long hence as he shows now. Now. Now is probably the most important word in the entirety of the Shakespeare authorship debate. Soft you now. The fair Ophelia, nymph in thy orisons, be all my sins remembered. Ophelia, good my lord, how does your honour for this many a day? I'll talk of that in part two. I humbly thank you, well, well, well. My lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have longed, longed to re-deliver. I pray you now receive them. No, no, I never gave you aught. My honoured lord, I know right well you did, and with the words of so sweet breath composed as made the things more rich than perfume left. Take these again, for to the noble mind, rich gifts wax poor, when givers prove unkind. There, my lord. Ha <laughs> ha, are you honest, my lord? Are you... F that, was, that was Hamlet's voice, it's supposed to be Ophelia's voice, sorry. My lord, are you fair? What means your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse. Is that Ophelia's voice? Oh god, I'm messing up all the characters, doesn't really matter. Shut up, Glenn, read! But if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than your honesty? 
commerce. We've met commerce to be sold by John Wright. I truly, Veer means true, I truly for the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a board than the force of honesty can translate beauty into his likeness. This was sometime a paradox, but now the time gives it proof. I did love you once. Indeed, my lord, you made me believe so. You should not have believed me, for the virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. I loved you not. I was more deceived. Get thee to a nunnery. Funny when you realise that nunnery is none, nothing. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent, honest, but yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. I am very proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offences at my beck than I have thoughts to put them in imagination to give them shape, or time to act them in. What should such fellows as I do, crawling between heaven and earth, we are arrant knaves all, believe none of us. Go thy ways to a nunnery. Where's your father? At home, my lord. Let the doors be shut upon him, that he, will, he may play the fool. No way. Oh, happy April Fool's Day. No better day than to give the world the world's greatest joke, but in one's house. Farewell. Oh, help him, you sweet heavens. If thou dost marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow, thou shalt not escape calumny. Get thee to a nunnery, go, farewell. Or if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool, for wise man, men, know well enough. What monsters you make of them, to a nunnery, go, and quickly too, farewell. Ophelia, O oh, heavenly powers, restore him. Remember, there is a O on O rare Ben Jonson, the grave under which this poet is still standing. I have heard of your prattlings too well enough. God has given you one pace and you make yourself another. You gidge, you amble and you lisp and nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go to I'll no more on't. It hath made me mad. I say we will have no more marriages. Those that are married already, all but one shall live. The rest shall keep as they are to a nunnery go. And Ophelia. Now you'll notice there's two noble minds in this speech, in the missing lines and here. Oh, Ophelia. Oh, what a noble mind is here o'erthrown, the courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword, the expectancy and rose, we've met our rose, of the fair state, the glass, well it was made out of glass, of fashion and the mould of form, the observed of all observers, quite, quite down. Have I of ladies most deject and wretched that sucked the honey of his music vows, now see the noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth blasted with ecstasy. Oh, woe is me that have seen what I have seen. See what I see. And I hope you can. So, to the judgment that yourself arise, you live in this and dwell in lovers' eyes. So in part two, we will look at the inward worth and the inward love of heart, which is the music to the ear. Then happy I that love and am beloved, where I may not remove nor be removed. And I will end with, then may I dare to boast how I do love thee. Because he did love you. Eyes since closed, eyes I hope are open, and eyes yet to be born still 
to wander. Thank you.